I just want to spend a few minutes talking you through the whole gate and star approach to exegesis. The reason I want to explore this with you is because this is the method of exegesis that students on the worship leading and preaching course are encouraged to adopt as they plan the services that they are going to be leading um, and also as they fill out the uh, services led by me forms which they need to submit in folder two of their portfolio. So I thought what would be helpful is if I talk you through the process step by step and also talk through the areas of uh, the form that the students are filling out to tell you what we're expecting to see, what we're not wanting to see, um, and also how you as mentors can help students engage properly with the exegesis process and what you as tutors should be looking for as you read through those forms and are providing feedback to the students. So let's dive in, shall we? First thing I want to say is that uh, this method you can find in the Biblical Hermeneutics book that has been released by Holgate and Starr. Uh, students on the course are encouraged to read this as they work their way through. You can buy it for about £20 on Amazon and it, it may well be worth you as mentors and tutors having it in your library, at least having a, a familiarity with what's said even if you're not going to read it cover to cover. Um, but it is quite helpful and should actually encourage you in your own Bible reading as well, so it may well be worth getting a hold of a copy of. You can also go on the website. Uh, if you go to the Moodle, then you can find an overview of this approach to exegesis. Uh, there's a great video from Rachel Starr on there. Um, but you can also be taught through the process in both modules 2.1 in the prepare section and also module 5.2 in the prepare section. So if you want to be familiar with, what, uh, with the model and what you're being asked to do, what the students are being asked to do, then, then you can check out those sections as well. I want to begin by suggesting that actually exegesis is a little bit like driving. It's the kind of thing that when you're first learning how to do it, everything feels very clunky. You're not used to it at all. You're having to think through every step, every mode, you know, even something which later becomes um, really natural, like, uh, you know, clutch and acceleration control and kind of easing off the clutch as you accelerate. Uh, in early days of exegesis, you may find yourself stalling quite a lot. Students may find themselves finding it slightly frustrating and unnatural and uh, kind of counterintuitive. But the more you do it, the more natural it becomes, the easier it becomes, the less you have to think about it. It just becomes a bit second nature. The funny thing about driving is that uh, if you stop doing it for a while, it then feels clunky again. I don't know about you, but as we've spent the last four months um, at the time of recording in lockdown, um, Every time I get in my car, which is only probably about once a fortnight every three weeks at the minute, I find myself being far more aware of the driving process, having to think about it that little bit more, uh, which is interesting to me. And I had a conversation recently with a friend who said it took them 15 minutes to parallel park and they had to kind of pause halfway through and give themselves a talking to because they couldn't believe that something that was so normal to them was suddenly so difficult. So it may be that actually as we're talking about exegesis, perhaps you haven't done in-depth exegesis yourself for a while, and therefore it might be worth you uh, giving it another go, trying to warm yourself back into it, and, and hopefully then it will become second nature again for you too. But, but this is really just an encouragement for you and your students to remember that um, it, it will take some time to cultivate, it will take some time to practice, but, but it can become very natural very quickly um, as long as you keep at it. So let's dive into uh, the method then. Um, so when students are filling out their, their planning form, the first question they're asked to consider is how well do I know the passage? And quite often we may get a very short response, something that says a bit like, not very, I don't know it very well, which, which is sort of, I mean, that may be truthful, it may be a, an okay answer. But I suppose the point of this question is to consider and be really honest about their familiarity with the text. The reason this is important is because texts that we feel like we're familiar with, we're less inclined to ask critical questions of. So if we feel like we know it really, really well, we're probably just going to jump to what we imagine it, it means and, and teach from what we know, rather than open ourselves up to other learning or engagement with commentaries or um, different points of view. So actually, it's a helpful starting point just to think, you know, how much expectation, how many questions am I bringing to the text as I start? It could be that as you're helping your students engage with this, an activity that you might want to uh, try out is to test their familiarity. So you may ask them, you know, if they're preaching on something like the parable of the sower, 
you may ask them how well they know it, get them to describe it or to recite it without looking. Can they remember all the details? Can they remember the different types of soil, the order that the, uh, the seed falls on the different types of soil, what, what, um, what they represent? You know, are there gaps in their thinking? Do they just kind of broad brush strokes know what it's about or do they actually know the nitty gritty? Um, that might be a really helpful way of helping open their eyes up to what they may or may not need to study and, and, and um, the lines of inquiry they might want to go down as they're preparing their, their preach. The other thing I massively encourage you to do is to read the passage aloud together several times and then ask, well, what has stood out to us? The reason why it's really helpful to read it together and out loud is when we hear someone else read a text, we are given insight into how they interpret it. So they will use different tones and different inflections and different voices um, as they read it to us. And so something may stand out just as we listen of, oh, I wonder why they put the emphasis there, or I wonder why they've interpreted the character feeling that way in how they read it. And again, that opens us up to, to different ways of approaching the text, not necessarily the ways that we will always read it then ourselves, but certainly to realize that, that the, um, our immediate expectations of the text are not necessarily the only expectations of the text. So that what, that's what step one is all about. How well do I know the passage? Uh, encourage your students to give a little bit more detail than just not very or very well. Step two is uh, about what do I notice about the way the passage is written? And the point here is to begin to get the student to reflect on what is the style, what is the genre, what is the flow of the text, are there any literary techniques in place? their key images, their ideas and events. So, so this is things like, you know, is this a parable? Is this um, literal history? Is this um, a teaching point? Is this narrative? Is this apocalyptic language or poetry? Um, it's getting them to consider things like, you know, is there humor present in the text? Is, is there key wording? You know, if you're studying Mark and you're suddenly encountering the language of son of man, do I know what that wording means? Where's that coming from? What, what is the kind of loaded meaning in that term? Is it just a name Jesus adopted to it for himself or is there something more going on? So that's what students are being encouraged to write about. What have I noticed is, is present in kind of the literary nature of this. So an activity you might want to try with them as they are engaging with this part of the process is to analyze the text together, just, just to begin to chart out what are the events going on What's the main subject matter of the text? Is there, who's the audience? Who, who's being addressed um, by the text? Are there, are there particular characters in it? You know, what's the tone of it? Um, is there some of that coloration? And, and just begin to kind of pull out these things in, in conversation together. Once you've done that, the other thing you might want to do is then write a list of things to explore. So what else might need to be researched to help the student get familiar with a text? Um, so again, you're, you're looking at things like, um, you know, if, if there's key imagery or typology going on, or, you know, what do you understand about the genre of apocalyptic? Do you, do you know what, what that genre means and what's going on there? Those are the things, this, this is to help them begin to open up avenues of exploration to better engage. And, and you can see some examples of that in uh, module 5.2, if you check that out on the website, exercise 17 is particularly useful for that. Step three then is, I suppose, when they start to do more of their exegesis. Um, and there's a particular question that they're asked in their form is, uh, what do I notice when I compare different translations of the passage? And I suppose what's being asked here is, um, encouraging the students to consider how has the text been translated or interpreted differently in different versions of the Bible? So sometimes we get these answers like, well, the message version is much easier to understand and the King James version uses very complicated language. And that's true, but I suppose what's being compared there is actually the translations themselves rather than the interpretation that's gone into them. So uh, I'm gonna give you an example in a second to, to um, explain that a little bit further, but some activities, again, you might wanna try as mentors or, or as tutors even is, um, to help students compare passages together and get them to consider not just how words change, but with them the tone and the inference and the, and the way that we receive them. Um, 
it'd be helpful to have some go-to examples and, and that's why I'll come to one in a second. But the other thing is you, you can help them with word studies. Um, so if you have a Strong's Concordance or if you use blueletterbible.com, which is a, an online concordance, you can help them explore uh, the actual kind of literal Greek translation and, and then how the Bible has chosen to interpret things. And um, that's helpful for them to be aware of. Uh, it's just a good biblical study technique to make sure that we are actually teaching what the Bible says and not, not just what one interpreter or one particular Bible thinks is being said. Um, and another fun, slightly uh, tongue-in-cheek activity, I suppose, is, is you can encourage the students uh, by cross-examining them. So one of the reasons it's helpful to compare different translations is it, it may help them consider which is the best version for the sermon I'm going to preach. Uh, why have I adopted this? Have I adopted it just because it's the one I think sounds the nicest or helps me say the message I want to say? Is it the one I think is the most accurate? So you can, you can get them to just defend a little bit like you're in a courtroom. You can, you can ham up the drama of this if you want, but um, get them to think through, okay, so why have you adopted this? Why have you chosen in your reading to read the NIV version, not the NRSV version or the NLT version or the message version? And, and see if they can defend themselves. And as long as they can give a good kind of thought through considered answer, that's great. That's exactly what we're looking for. Let me illustrate all this with an example because I think it makes things clearer. So here we have um, a passage from Mark chapter one. So a man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Now that's the NIV translation of Mark chapter one. Let's read the NRSV translation now. A leper came to Jesus begging him and kneeling, he said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country and people came to him from every quarter. Now, what I want to hone in on is that bit at uh, verse 41 where we have this language in the NIV, we have this idea that Jesus was indignant, which is a very particular translation. It actually portrays Jesus in a, in a comf um, kind of a uncomfortably frustrated way. And it, it can change the whole tone with which we read the rest of the passage. By contrast, the NRSV uses this language of moved with pity. And again, that, that changes the way that we receive Jesus' words. It changes the tone that we understand it in. And it can affect the, the reading of the whole rest of the passage. It's interesting that actually the result of Jesus healing this man and this man going off and telling people is that Jesus can no longer enter a town freely. So again, in the NIV, we have this interesting thing. Um, instead, which makes it kind of sound very almost aggressive. Instead, he went out, you know, he directly disobeyed Jesus. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. You know, the interpretation is really interesting that it, it implies that Jesus was, was put out by what the man did. But it was OK because people still came to him from everywhere. Whereas in the NRSV, we have but, which is a slightly softer term than instead. It, it maybe seems less like a direct disobedience. And then it says Jesus could no longer go into a town openly but stayed out in the country. So Jesus in this version isn't lonely at all. Um, he's just kind of hanging around in a nice countryside and people are still coming to him. So it, it doesn't really impact his ministry. So actually, can you, can you see how the, the, the translation choices, it's not just about kind of the type of words used and how accessible it is. It's about the, the way that it changes the tone and the reception of 
uh, what's actually going on. Interestingly, um, if we check out the Greek, if you want to do a word study, all other appearances of the word there, which is translated moved with pity, um, are actually positive. So actually they're to do with compassion, it's, it's a good thing. So actually indignant, if you like, is the only time that this word is translated with that kind of strength of phrase. So that might suggest that the NRSV version, which talks about Jesus being moved with pity, is better than the NIV version, which casts him as indignant. However, the context of the passage, that the stern warning comes next, and then the man disobeys Jesus, and it seems to have an impact on his ministry, that does suggest a more negative reading of the whole story. It does suggest that something's gone wrong here. And actually, that may be why the NIV thinks the term indignant is more in keeping with the tone of the story. The reality is, as we come to the text as readers, we have an interpretive decision to make. Which of these do we think is the most accurate portrayal of events? Or, as a preacher, if either of these are um, acceptable readings, which is the most helpful for the message that you want to share? And this is what we mean about helping students come to considered decisions about the text that they're going to use when they preach. And, and this is why the question, going back to it, of what do I notice when I compare different translations? This is why this is particularly helpful. So our next step is, um, what point do I think the writer is intending to make? That's the question that your students are gonna be asked. And we sometimes, again, we get these um, slightly shallow answers about, you know, the point the writer is trying to make is Jesus was a nice guy. And, that may be part of it. It may be that actually that's what the writer's trying to do, but everything that exists in the Bible, every story, every parable, every uh, piece of narrative, every piece of teaching, every psalm, all of these have fulfilled a function in the life of the community that that piece of writing was written for. And so we want to ask a deeper question. What message did the writer want to convey? What impact did they want to make? How were they trying to shape and form the community that they were writing to? And that's actually a deeper question than just kind of what, what is this about, I suppose. So a couple of uh, things that you may want to try. One of these, and you could try this out maybe in an explore session, is what's known as an Ignatius reading of the text. And this is an imagination exercise where uh, the idea is you close your eyes or, or you have the text read to you or you read it deeply a few times. And as you do, you picture yourself in the audience. So you picture yourself observing a miracle or listening to Jesus teaching or you, you picture yourself being a fly on the wall of the, the, the events of the, the story taking place. Or you imagine yourself listening to the psalm being sung in the temple or something. And you ask yourself, OK, who, who else is here? Who's speaking? What is everyone here hearing? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? You're, you're, you're trying to um, put yourself in, in the environment of the audience and imagine what the writer is trying to provoke in you. And sometimes that can be a helpful way of exploring, you know, what, what point is the writer intending to make? The other thing is to um, just look at context and patterns. So if a student makes a conclusion about what point the writer is intending to make, you can check, does that seem to line up with the author's general agenda? If you're reading a story in John's gospel and you're interpreting it one way, does that seem to line up with what often happens in John's gospel? Because a lot of biblical writers are very clever at finding multiple ways of making the same point and using multiple stories to emphasize the same ideas. And so if, if you actually are uh, reading a particular section, you think, I think it means this. And then you read the rest of the kind of context around it and you think, oh, but actually, generally speaking, this seems to be the point that's going on. Maybe you need to adapt your original interpretation of the passage in question. That's just a, a few thoughts around how you begin to get to grips with what the writer, what, is they, what are they trying to say, what are they trying to make you think or feel or believe or imagine. Step five uh, has to do then with, again, some, some of the kind of key exegesis pieces. Of what have I learned about the background of the passage and the times that it was written in? So the point here is to consider the kind of historical, pol uh, political, philosophical, economic backdrop of a text. What's going on behind the words? What shaped the context that um, encouraged the writer to write in the first place? 
So if you're a tutor or a mentor, probably one of the best things that you can do um, to help your student get to grips with this is to do it with them. Again, spend some time exploring the background together and you can do that online, um, you know, totally fine to Google stuff, but maybe teach them the websites to consider reliable and those to kind of filter out a little bit. Um, obviously don't believe everything that you read on Wikipedia or Sermon Central. Um, but you know, learn to scrutinize, but, but do go on a fact finding mission. Okay, you know, what, what was the context? What was going on here? And just as a suggestion, um, if your student's spending two to five years or so working through the worship leading and preaching course, maybe as a kind of on running activity, have a number of books that you're gonna look to read together. And a few well chosen generalist books might help ones that are really helpful windows of insight into the historical and cultural context of the times that uh, the kind of the New Testament, the Old Testament was written in, that if they're generalist, it means you're not just looking at a commentary on Corinthians and trying to understand the world of Corinth, although that is important and valuable. You know, you're kind of understanding the Greco-Roman context, um, the, the, the backdrop to the whole of the New Testament, which, which means that you... If you learn that, if you read those books together, then hopefully every time you come to a New Testament passage, you, you're already equipped with that knowledge. So you don't necessarily have to go straight after uh, specific commentaries because you have enough generalist knowledge of the backdrop to be able to interpret the text against it. A couple of suggestions would be something like Paul in Fresh Perspective from Tom Wright, um, Reading Backwards, which is a, a great book by uh, Richard Hayes. Uh, or this strange and sacred scripture by a guy called Schlim, which is particularly about the Old Testament. Um, but you, you'll you have your own and you can find your own. And, and if you're ever wondering, um, do ping me a message because I'm really happy to give you some further thoughts on these, these generalist background books as well. Next step then is, uh, what have I discovered from biblical commentaries or study notes? And, and the point here, I suppose, is... Um, to explore what scholars have discovered about a text and consider how that changes our understanding. I've read a few responses to this section in a form before that basically say, I haven't discovered a lot. Um, and I, if I'm honest, I find that response kind of troubling because um, you know, I, I, I study uh, theology in, in my spare time. And, and one of the things I find amazing is how much I constantly learn and how much I constantly discover that I don't know. Um, one of the, key aspects of the worship leading and preaching courses that we want to encourage students to develop a lifelong learning attitude where they're they're hungry to learn they're hungry to grow and so if they're engaging with commentaries or study notes and they're not learning a lot then it's worth probing that and asking what they're reading and why they haven't got anything out of it one of the things i'd encourage you to do as students engage at this stage is to help them criticize their sources so if they have gotten something off of a website, um, you know, talk to them about what the website is, what makes them trust that. Do they know who's written it? Um, you know, there are some phenomenal biblical scholars out there um, who are world renowned and blog for free. And I'd be very encouraged to see someone ref referencing them. I'd be less encouraged to see someone referencing someone who they, they've got no idea of, who kind of lives in some backwater somewhere and actually doesn't necessarily have anything that qualifies their ideas. So help them to kind of like um, judge their sources a little bit. And, and we can, to do that, you can go back to our imaginary courtroom from earlier where you cross-examine the witness, get them to kind of explain why they're, they're someone who's worth listening to, why their testimony counts. Um, but yeah, so I'd, I'd encourage you as well to just have a list of resources that you are prepared to point students towards that you, you think, hey, if you're trying to get to grips with this, start here. Use some of these people as a starting point. Um, that, that is as good a way of any as, as helping them begin to kind of consider who they want to reference and who they want to learn from and, and what they need to filter. Our next step, um, the next question that they're going to be asked to explore is, in what ways has my interpretation been challenged or expanded by the interpretation of others? And this is a really important one. Um, you may have gotten used to hearing me say this already, that we are better readers of the text and we are more faithful Christians when we open ourselves up to the reading of others. And that doesn't mean that we therefore have to agree with or take on board everything that everyone says. 
but it does mean that we have to acknowledge that God is at work in them as they read the text and that they may bring certain experiences, certain lenses, certain ideas, certain background understanding to the text that we don't. And that chances are we can be provoked from, we can, be, we can learn as much from being provoked or agitated by their point of view as we can from agreeing with it, I suppose. So the point here is to consider the ways in which the exegesis process has challenged, shaped and developed their understanding. And again, it, it really should have. If, if, then, if they're finding that they haven't really grown at all, I would, I would push back gently as a tutor and say, have you really done your homework here? If you, if you haven't been challenged or shaped or if you're understanding, if you haven't been opened up to an idea that you've disagreed with at any point or that you've learned from at any point, you probably haven't done enough background work. So one of the activities you can do as a mentor or tutor is, um, if, if you're this way inclined, and I certainly am in some of the work I do with um, biblical studies students, is to take the role of devil's advocate. Just um, whatever point of view the student brings, see if you can play an opposing point of view, just to help them recognize that the way that they might naturally see it isn't the only way of seeing it. Um, if needs be, go looking for some alternative points of view and, and then kind of try and represent that position. Or alternatively, encourage the student to represent that position to see if actually they can imbibe something of that themselves. And the other thing you can do is simply go digging. If you're not sure they've, they've gone deep enough, ask the questions that encourage them to relate their learning process. What have you done? Where have you gotten that from? Why do you think it can only be seen that way? Have you thought about this? All of these sorts of open-ended questions will either help you be satisfied as a tutor that they have actually done their homework, or it will help them realize themselves as students that they have. Finally, um, the kind of final stage, I, I suppose, of, of the whole process is that they are encouraged to say in one sentence, what is the good news today from this text? And we do believe that as we read the Bible, God reveals good news to us. Um, and of course, that is a key point of preaching is to kind of um, encourage and build up and strengthen one another in faith. I suppose my concern is sometimes as we, we engage with portfolios, one of the things we see is um, that what students have said uh, doesn't necessarily really relate to their exegesis. So they could have done this whole brilliant piece of exegesis about, you know, this story in the Old Testament about David and Goliath. And then what is the good news from this text today is Jesus loves me, this I know. And you're like, well, Jesus wasn't even in that story. So, so how is that the good news from that text? Um, I'm being slightly facetious and giving a slightly extreme example, but it's not that Jesus doesn't love us. It's that we need to see consistency, I suppose, between uh, what they're studying and how they are relaying that, um, how, how they're, they're seeing that bring good news um, into today's world and how they might preach that. Um, I suppose the point of this section really is to say, can you come up with a clear conclusion from the text that can then become the basis of your acts of worship for any given service? Um, so if you're a tutor or a mentor, one of the things that you can do is... Um, Firstly, help students explore the idea of good news. It is worth saying that there are parts of the Bible that are really tricky. That one thing I really value about the Bible is that it is not in denial about the nature of reality, that it can be hard and it can be tough. An awful lot of what Jesus said is deeply personally challenging and troubling. Like there's goodness within it, don't get me wrong, but um, it's worth exploring with the student that good news can be hard news or, um, you know, it can be good news for the future, not necessarily for now. And actually helping students engage with that and, and helping students lead congregations into that is really powerful. Good news doesn't have to mean easy, comfortable or joy filled. If you're reading Ecclesiastes or um, some of the other wisdom literature, there's an awful lot in there which uh, is not easy or comfortable or joy filled, but it is good. It's just tough. So that's one thing that you can do is expand their interpretation of good news. Secondly, just as I say, check their consistency. If you're a tutor and you um, can see what they've exegeted and you can't see any kind of correlation between that and what they've preached, have the conversation with them. If you're a mentor and um, you know, you've gone through the exegesis process with your student and, and yet at the end, the, the, the kind of sermon or the, the, service that they prepared doesn't really correlate just challenge them on that 
this is as much as anything about us making sure we don't cheapen um, the church or, or we don't rip off our congregations by not actually leading them into the fullness of the truth that the Bible contains. So it's actually a really exciting and quite a big deal. Um, so would really encourage you to do both of those things. So hopefully that is a helpful kind of little window of insight into um, what we're after when we're uh, marking portfolios, what we're expecting of tutors and mentors as they are engaging with their students and what we're hoping to see from students as, um, as they engage in the exegesis process. Just to say again, some of that might feel clunky, but think about driving a car. It does become non more natural. It does become more easy. It does become more second nature. Um, and if you're ever wanting some more insight into kind of tips for how to do it, or if you're looking for some more resources to point people towards or anything like that, you can always contact me or any other member of the East Central team and we'd be really happy to help. Hope you found that informative and um, do come back to us if you have any questions or, or pop them in the comments box below. Thanks. <laughs>